to be able to get to questions uh, in the latter half of the meeting. So over to yourself, Graham, and welcome yet again. Right. Uh, thanks very much, um, Mark and Wendy. Um, welcome to all colleagues to this week's COVID-19 Echo Clinic webinar hosted by the Department of Medicine at the University of Cape Town. Um, the format for this afternoon's webinar is very similar to what we've had for the last few weeks, uh, starting off with an update uh, on the epidemic in the Western Cape, followed by our main talk, uh, and then a panel discussion and questions from the floor in the form of the chat room. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce Marianne Davies, um, our colleague from the Western Cape Department of Health and the School of Public Health at UCT who's going to give us a brief update on surveillance uh, of COVID-19 uh, in the Western Cape province. So thanks very much, Marianne. Um, thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, just wait for the slides to come up. Okay, so um, doing this on behalf of the outbreak response team in the Western Cape, and we can move to the next slide. This is what I hope everybody looks at at one minute past one every day, which is our public facing uh, Western Cape coronavirus dashboard, which is uh, updated daily at 1 p.m. And this week we passed three milestones. We uh, went over 10,000 cases and in fact through to 11,000 today. Um, about 500 new cases a day over the last week. Uh, we also went over 200 deaths, so today we're reporting a cumulative total of 211 deaths, and we now have cases in every single district in the Western Cape. Until uh, Monday, the Central Karoo was the last area to be COVID-free in the Western Cape, and some of us were considering relocating there to escape uh, COVID-19. But as of Monday, we had our first case in the Beaufort West sub-district. So you can see that our map is now almost entirely pink. Uh, you'll notice on the left-hand side, the sub-districts with the greatest number of cases. And I just want you to bear that in mind because I'll come back to that in uh, a couple of slides time. If you move to the next slide. Um, so this is looking at hospitalizations to general wards in blue, ICUs in orange, and then uh, fatalities in red over, um, so the, the solid lines show the weekly average, the dotted lines are the daily variation. And we're having about, over the past week, about 55 new admissions to general wards a day and just under 10 uh, fatalities and ICU admissions per day. The gap between our um, general ward admissions and our ICU admissions has grown considerably, um, and that possibly reflects a shift from private to public sector and also to the recognition that patients do not do well in ICU and the use of uh, potentially more high flow oxygen outside of ICU and not using ventilation. Um, it just in the, the deaths Certainly, this reflects, uh, goes up to the 15th, um, and the reason for that is because we do have a bit of a reporting delay, so we can't report right up to yesterday, but I can uh, confirm in the last two days, we've had uh, 10 fatalities per, per day, and we can go to the next slide. This is looking at testing, and um, you can see on the top left hand side the number of tests per day and there are two things I want to highlight. The first is that uh, in the most recent uh, week we've seen a reduction in the number of tests that might be partly because we're looking at test results and we know the turnaround time has been slow with the huge volume of tests but it probably also reflects a reduction, particularly in the dark green of the community screening and testing activities as it becomes increasingly recognized that we do have widespread transmission, certainly in the metro, and that the value of these tests is limited and that um, uh, adding this number of tests is contributing to the swamping of our systems. On the right hand side, you can see the testing positivity over time, which has increased steadily. I think the steep increase in the last day, particularly in the private sector, is, is probably an artifact and also 
um, because I think the positive test results or the results where people are most likely to be positive are put through as urgent. So we, we sort of have an artifactual uptick in positivity when we look just at the last couple of days, but you can certainly see the increasing trend across all groups of testing, um, private and, and public. And then to show you at the bottom, and this is relating back to my side of the whole province, where we look at the number of tests done by sub-district and the positivity by sub-district, and the top block is the last two weeks of April, the second block is the first two weeks of May, and you can see firstly the striking increase in positivity across all sub-districts in the metro, but also that the number of cases that we see per sub-district is highly dependent on the number of tests being done. So Tigerberg, you will have seen, is, is leading the race in terms of number of uh, positives, but that's also because they've done by far the most tests. Uh, and we can move to the next slide. I thought I'd just highlight uh, selected groups that we follow carefully. Obviously, healthcare workers, very relevant to this webinar. So we have uh, cumulatively about 400 healthcare workers uh, who have been infected in the province, about 15 new cases being identified daily. And very sadly today, we heard of the fifth fatality in a health worker in the province. And then on the right-hand side, another group we're focusing on are the long-term care facilities. We have 20 of these facilities that we know about that have had cases, um, a, a total contributing a, a fairly large number of cases, um, well, not such a huge number, but a, a, a reasonable number of cases cumulatively in the province. You can see the sort of daily um, spikes there, which are where a whole facility has been tested and then we, we found large numbers of positives and importantly about 60% of those identified are actually staff members. Um, if we move to the next slide. Um, I presented previously on comorbidities and I thought I'd just reflect a little bit more detail on that. Um, so what we're looking at here is the proportion of our public sector patients, and we've limited to public sector patients because that's where we have reasonable evidence of comorbidities, who have comorbidity uh, split out by age group on the left-hand side for those over 55 and on the right-hand side under 55, and really moving from patients with no, who haven't yet been diagnosed with COVID on the left in each graph through to COVID cases who don't get admitted or die, and then COVID admissions and COVID deaths on the far right of each graph. Importantly for the lines, the comorbidities are based on the routine public sector data that we have available on these patients, which is based on that comorbidity being diagnosed uh, through a lab test or being treated in the public sector. Um, so there may be some under ascertainment uh, we don't, of course, have obesity as a comorbidity, but we do collect that information on every single death. So that's been added as the purple dot in the COVID death group. And I think just a couple of things to point out. If we go from no COVID to a COVID diagnosis, there really isn't a huge change in comorbidities, except uh, perhaps in uh, diabetes and hypertension, and that may not reflect an increased risk of acquisition but rather an increased diagnosis in those groups. But as we move to more severe disease with admission and death, we see a striking increase in the proportion of people with comorbidities, particularly in the younger age group, which I think is, is what we would expect. Um, two things that are different between the younger and the older age groups are uh, far more HIV and TB in the younger age group, as we would expect. Importantly, these percentages, if you've done the sums, don't add up to 100%, and that's because many people have multiple comorbidities. In fact, 65% of the deceased patients have uh, two or more comorbidities, which you can see on the top right. And then showing, if you move to the next slide, we have a very preliminary look at a uh, multivariate survival model where we've just looked at sex, age, and NCD associations with death in our COVID public sector data to date. We're limited to the public sector where we had reasonable ascertainment of prior comorbidities. And although we are watching HIV and TB very closely, we haven't included this yet because we don't think the numbers are big enough. Um, 
but I think what is reassuring in terms of the um, robustness of our data is that we are seeing the expected patterns in terms of increased risk for men, increased with increasing age, and then particularly in terms of the comorbidities, the risk of, uh, or the hazard ratio of fall, which uh, Graham, I mean, Andrew referred to briefly uh, and of relevance to uh, Joel Dave's talk last week. And then if we can just um, go to the next slide. Um, so what I wanted to remind you, this is supposed to be about COVID, but uh, we have other conditions in this province that are important. And this is just showing that we have seen an impact of lockdown and de-escalation on our routine HIV and TB services. On the left-hand side, we're looking at art initiations by month and calendar year, and on the right-hand side, um, drug-sensitive TB treatment initiations. And you can see in April a marked drop in both of those um, events in 2020 compared to 2019. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much, Marianne, once again, for that uh, really up-to-date and comprehensive update on the epidemic. I just wanted to ask you one question regarding um, the ascertainment uh, of obesity in uh, the, the patients that had, had died. Do you think that, that you're getting complete ascertainment? Because our, our impression is that a lot of the more severe cases are among people who are overweight and obese. Um, and I saw that in, in for, for the young age group, it was just 30% in, in what, you, what you were reporting uh, among the deaths. So that's a great question, Graham, and, and perhaps um, this is an opportunity to talk to clinicians in the, at least in the public sector platform. What would be very nice to do if that is something that's being recorded is to look at the data that we are getting and compare with what's actually being recorded in some of our hospitals in the clinical platform so that we can get a sense of what the extent of under ascertainment is. We have looked at the other comorbidities and what we have in our data compared to what's being reported in the deaths and it actually matches very closely. But I think obesity is something that's, uh, because it's you know, based not on a lab diagnosis um, or on receiving treatment that may be underreported. Okay, great. Thanks again, Marianne. Um, so we are now gonna move along to our main speaker for today. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Max O'Donnell. Uh, Max is an assistant professor of medicine and epidemiology at Columbia University in New York. Uh, he's a pulmonologist and critical care specialist whose research interests are in global health, HIV, TB, and severe acute respiratory uh, infections. Um, and Max knows South Africa well. A lot of his research uh, has been done on uh, TB and drug resistant TB. He also uh, conducts research in Uganda, and is involved in uh, research capacity building in Ethiopia. Uh, over the last three months, being based in New York, he's been involved in the critical care of patients with COVID-19. Uh, obviously, we all know that that is the most severely uh, affected city in the world um, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and Max is going to share with us today some of the critical care experiences uh, from New York uh, and some of the research uh, that his group has been undertaking. So thanks very much, uh, Max, and we, and we look forward to the talk. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Cape Town. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you, and I'm going to try to get the slideshow going. Good. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a, a big change for me to come and speak with South Africans and uh, to speak as someone who's at the epicenter of an infectious disease uh, epidemic, um, usually coming to Durban and speaking to my colleagues there who are um, you know, working on TB and, 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 and HIV and sort of coming uh, from a slightly different um, perspective. And so, yeah, for the last uh, two or three months, we've been working very hard to try to sort of treat uh, patients and manage um, disease as much as you have. Um, and it was very interesting to see the Western Cape um, numbers um, because they sort of, uh, in some ways, mimic um, the numbers that we've seen in New York. Let me try to battle and get this. Ah, here we are. So the overview, uh, of my presentation. I'm going to speak very briefly about the epidemiology of uh, COVID-19 in New York City. 
I'm going to talk about a, um, uh, the epidemiology of the COVID among the critically ill at my hospital at Columbia University Medical Center. I'm going to give a case presentation of a very sick um, young woman with COVID that I admitted, um, I guess, three weeks ago Sunday. Um, and then talk to you briefly about an ongoing randomized controlled trial of convalescent plasma in critically ill patients uh, that we're performing. Hmm. Okay. All right. Right. So uh, it's been incredibly dramatic. We had our first um, uh, COVID nineteen patient at our hospital on uh, admitted on I believe May. I'm um, sorry, March second. Uh, and um, at that point, we had an open protocol through the ISARIC um, consortium, the uh, International Severe Acute Respiratory Infection Consortium. And we were enrolling these patients one by one. My, my fellow Matt Cummings was enrolling these patients. And then there was a deluge. Um, so at our hospital, um, over the weeks between, say, March 13th and, and April 13th, we had over 4,000 COVID admissions. And um, it's, you know, it frankly uh, overwhelmed us. And that sort of um, has been the case in the city overall. So in, um, you know, up to date uh, with the COVID outbreak in New York City, there've been 193,000 admissions um, to date um, and over uh, 15,800 deaths um, from COVID-19 uh, during this time period. If we include the suspected COVID deaths, so patients who died at home or at care homes without a proper diagnosis, it brings us to um, over 20,000 deaths or about a 10.6% mortality. However, since the uh, denominator in terms of the true number of COVID-19 uh, patients in the city is unknown, uh, it is likely that, that this, is, uh, this percentage is an overestimate. Hmm. So um, you know, one of the um, unique features we have working in New York City is that it's a very um, you know, uh, uh, multiracial city. It's a very um, diverse city. And um, you know, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> that, that sort of uh, d diversity has been seen in COVID-19 cases. And there's been a real sort of uh, racial um, as well as economic um, you know, um, differential in terms of um, severe cases as well as cases presented. And so what you can see in this figure, which is uh, data from the city of New York, is uh, that African Americans and uh, Hispanic Americans are sort of well overrepresented in um, uh, cases of uh, COVID-19, including non-hospitalized as well as um, confirmed and uh, uh, probable deaths. So now I'm going to pass over the epidemiology of the city and move us to the epidemiology at our medical center. So I work at Columbia University uh, Irving Medical Center, which is a 700 bed academic medical center in northern uh, Manhattan. We had at the start of the um, COVID outbreak about 119 ICU or critical care beds at our hospital. In between um, March 2nd and May 17th, we had over 4,000 uh, COVID hospital admissions with over 500 ICU admissions. So at our high point about three weeks ago, we had about 255 um, patients in our ICUs. And as you can see, we started the, the month with 119 ICU beds. So that meant we've created um, ICU beds throughout our hospital, including converting all of our operating rooms to ICUs, including all, uh, converting all of our uh, ambulatory and PACU to ICUs, and including setting up ICUs in our emergency room and on essentially all our floors, um, as well as upscale, up, uh, sort of changing the 
skill mix uh, of how we care for these patients. So, you know, typically we have an intensivist caring for patients in the ICU. And because of the overwhelming numbers, we've changed to a much more supervisory role. So rather an intensivist will supervise um, other physicians who care for ICU patients um, in order to achieve um, um, coverage of all these patients. So our first patient came in um, on March 2nd. He was a, a well-reported lawyer who was an index case and um, associated with a large outbreak in the suburbs around New York City. He was treated with, um, hmm. He was treated with remdesivir and discharged uh, home after about three weeks. And our subsequent case, uh, subsequent cases happened the, the next few days later. And again, um, we had about um, uh, 500 cases of, uh, admitted to the ICU over the next several weeks. So while this was happening, um, as part of my international work uh, with uh, collaborators from Uganda, I'm part of an international um, acute respiratory infection um, consortium called ISARIC that has members in um, 40 members uh, scattered throughout the world and um, has developed a um, international uh, protocol and um, case record form that is sort of used around the world to allow for harmonized collection of data um, primarily clinical data, but including um, um, the possibility of biological sample collection. And so uh, we put in this protocol in, in February, I'm sorry, in uh, January, and so we're very well prepared for the um, arrival of these patients, or so we thought, in, in February. So the study that I'm going to present to you uh, is from our hospital. It includes adult patients uh, who came to these two um, hospitals in our system between March 2nd and April 1st and followed through uh, April 29th. So everyone has at least 28 days of follow-up. All patients had laboratory-confirmed COVID-19, um, you know, or, or uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, by real-time PCR. They're all critically ill with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure at or during hospitalization. They weren't necessarily cared for in an ICU milieu uh, for the reasons that I, I spoke of earlier. They're, um, mechanical, they're all mechanically ventilated or received uh, high-level supplemental oxygenation, either by high-flow nasal cannula, non-rebreather mask, or fewer through um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Uh, we collected demographics, comorbidities, illness onset, symptom onset, and presenting uh, signs and symptoms. We collected uh, arterial blood gases, biochemical studies, including um, markers of inflammation, thrombosis, um, as you see listed. Uh, we collected data on uh, management and um, other advanced therapies, including renal replacement therapy. Our primary outcome was um, rate of in-hospital death, and we, our follow-up time was right censored on, um, on April 28th, 2020. We looked at secondary outcomes that included frequency and duration of mechanical ventilation, use of vasopressors and renal replacement therapy, as well as time to in-hospital clinical deterioration following admission. We used the um, WHO recommended ordinal scale of clinical status to look at uh, time to clinical deterioration. Um, and that's a seven point scale that's about came out of influenza work and has been used um, somewhat widely in COVID studies, particularly of therapeutics. Um, and that's uh, shown on the right side of the slide. Um, so during the study period that I described, there were 1,100 patients admitted to hospital with uh, laboratory confirmed COVID-19. Of these, 22% uh, were critically ill with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure as they're presenting um, critical illness diagnosis. So that's 257 patients. And patients were um, followed inpatient for on average 19 days. Uh, again, um, um, the patients, um, 
characteristics are sort of described on the, on the right-hand side, as we saw in the Western Cape. The majority of these patients are male. Um, the age distribution um, certainly skews heavily towards older ages, um, as you can see, um, <clears throat> with the median age being 62 years old. Um, you know, reflecting um, numerous factors, but including our um, sort of uh, catchment area, the majority of our patients were either uh, Latino, or the majority of our patients were Latino, um, with a great number of African-American patients as well, minority of our patients being white or, um, or Asian. Um, so this reflects both our catchment area, which we serve um, an area of Northern uh, Manhattan that in, um, and including the Bronx, um, which is a heavily uh, African-American Latino um, borough. Uh, but also, um, as you'll see later, I think it reflects some access to care and potentially care-seeking patterns as well. Okay, so when we look at how um, this demographic um, uh, age pattern plays out in terms of deaths, as you can sort of imagine, and as you saw in the Western Cape data, um, you know, the extremities of age um, uh, do very poorly when you're uh, critically ill and when you're critically ill with COVID. You know, so above the age of, of 70, um, the majority of our patients who were critically ill passed. You know, we had no patients in their 20s pass and very few in their 30s and 40s. And as you um, stated earlier, these were all patients with significant comorbidities. In terms of these comorbidities, our average patient who was admitted critically ill had two, uh, at least two comorbidities, including hypertension, diabetes, um, uh, chronic heart disease that included uh, valvular disease as well as heart failure, um, kidney disease, uh, COPD, and other disease. Of note, uh, very few of our patients uh, had HIV infection. This is um, perhaps less than would expect um, given the um, typical um, ICU um, admissions with uh, severe acute uh, respiratory infection. Um, on average, patients were sick for about five days before um, coming into hospital. But as I alluded before, this was sort of differential by race. So patients who are Black or African American um, in, in, uh, had, on average, seven days of illness before presenting. Uh, Hispanic or Latino, five days, and white, uh, three days. And this sort of uh, trend uh, was statistically significant. Um, the symptoms that patients presented with was sort of as you might expect in terms of shortness of breath and fever being the predominant uh, presentations. There was also, um, as we're recognizing, uh, a, uh, a substantial minority who had um, GI symptoms, including isolated GI symptoms um, um, and other uh, sort of uh, viral type symptoms. This is the average sort of vital signs on hospital presentation. Um, the patients had uh, almost universally infiltrates on chest x-ray, um, reduced oxygen saturation, and uh, uh, fever, as you see. When we look at the uh, biochemical markers, I'm not going to go read through every uh, one of these, but um, on average, um, patients had an elevated D-dimer, elevated um, uh, IL-6, um, and elevated procalcitonin, but these were not um, grossly elevated. <clears throat> when we looked at uh, critical care management, so this is something that is, is of interest to me. So these patients were uh, moderately, uh, at least moderately sick with a SOFA score of 11. Um, they had a PDAF ratio on day one of their critical illness of 129, so quite hypoxic. Um, 45 percent of them were initially managed on a non-rebreather mask. Um, Five percent of them only on high-flow nasal cannula, and so that reflected guidance from our hospital at the early, at that early stage of the epidemic. And the concern was for aerosolization of the virus, um, which I think has sort of subsequently um, the concern is sort of the index of concern is much lower, and. Um, you know, and, and uh, 
and uh, 203 of these 257 patients were in, uh, intubated on day one of their uh, presentation. Among those patients who were, um, I'm sorry, 203 of the 257 were intubated um, um, overall, including uh, day one, uh, but, um, but um, throughout the course of their, of their hospitalization. And there's sort of um, vent settings on initial uh, vent settings on, um, on intubation and mechanical ventilation. Um, so these patients were quite stiff. So the respiratory compliance was 27. Their driving pressure was 15. Um, their uh, tidal volume, um, cc's per keg ideal body weight was 6.2. So very close to uh, goal ARDSNET criteria. And on average, the patients were getting 100% FiO2 on day one. So these are quite sick patients. Uh, patients were treated with early um, 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 neuromuscular blockade with 25% of the patients. 17% uh, of the patients were prone. And again, this is sort of our very early experience. Subsequently, a quite a uh, higher proportion of patients were prone, but at that early stages, we only performed proning in our medical uh, ICUs as well as our surgical ICU. And many of these patients, as I said, were managed in operating rooms, emergency rooms, and on the floors where uh, proning wasn't initially performed. Similarly, we're an ECMO center. We do a lot of ECMO and um, very few of these patients received ECMO and uh, that was simply because of staffing issues. Uh, drawing your attention, uh, which is something that we wouldn't have expected, a large proportion of these patients, 31%, um, received renal replacement therapy, which is not something we, we would have necessarily expected, um, you know, at um, a priori uh, for a viral um, pneumonia uh, epidemic. When we look at our outcomes, 39% um, uh, of our patients uh, died in hospital. Um, and um, time to uh, duration of hospitalization prior to death was nine days uh, with an interquartile range of five to 15 days. Um, at, at the end of our study period, 37% um, or 94 out of these 257 patients were still hospitalized. Four of them had been transferred to another hospital. 23% had been discharged uh, alive of those um, 21% required auction uh, supplementation at discharge. On the right-hand side, you can see a Kaplan-Meier curve with a 95% um, confidence interval around the um, uh, effect estimate, or around the um, percent, um, showing uh, mortality uh, out through 40 days. And again, um, median time to clinical deterioration uh, following admission was three days, and that's a deterioration of two points on that uh, ordinal scale that I showed earlier. And 41% of our patients who received uh, mechanical ventilation died during hospitalization. Again, with the caveat that they're fully, a third of our patients are still hospitalized at the time of publication of this paper. When we look at risk factors for hospital mortality um, on uh, univariate and multivariate analysis, age per 10 year increase is our single most important um, risk factor um, with a 31% increase mortality per 10 year increase in age. Uh, male gender um, um, looks like it may have been slightly um, causally associated with mortality, but certainly not statistically significant at a, in our center. Symptom uh, duration before hospital presentation was similarly not associated. Um, hypertension, although um, it missed significance, there's still a large um, sort of uh, estimate of, of effect, so it should be thought of. Um, chronic cardiac disease, similarly. COPD was uh, present in only about 9% of our patients, but it was a very important um, um, uh, risk factor for patients who had that in terms of death. Um, <clears throat> diabetes, unlike in, in your data set, uh, did not, um, was not significantly associated with death, but the two biomarkers, IL-6 and, and D-dimer, were um, highly associated with, um, with death, and that's, um, so per decile increase, obviously these, um, 
these uh, markers are highly uh, right skewed. Um, and so that should be sort of, um, you know, understood that, um, you know, that uh, there are other ways of looking at this. And it really, um, that increase in mortality is highly driven by patients who had, um, you know, high increase in uh, IL-6 and D-dimer. So in summary, um, we're reporting a high proportion, 22% of our patients who presented um, with COVID-19 were presented critically ill. We presented very high rates of mortality among elderly intubated patients. Comorbidities and inflammatory and prothrombotic markers are really potent risk factors for mortality in our uh, population. And that there's a high prevalence of, uh, of uh, critical illness among uh, racial and ethnic minorities in New York City, which may reflect in part the underlying population served by our hospitals, but may also reflect access to care and patterns of care seeking behavior. So I would sort of uh, place a further sort of uh, bullet point to this, which is that, you know, obviously the, these data reflect um, patterns of um, epidemiologic patterns seen out at these two hospitals in Manhattan. Um, and they also reflect um, the uh, standards of care and delivery of care given at this early point in the, in the epidemic. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see as your data matures, how that relates to data seen in the Western Cape and elsewhere in South Africa. Okay, um, so next I was asked to present a case and, um, and this is sort of a patient um, that came to mind. Again, this is a young woman that I admitted um, three weeks ago Sunday when I was on overnight, um, so very close to my mind. Uh, so this was a 34 year old um, woman initially of, of uh, Nepalese, um, uh, uh, you know, um, national origin um, who was uh, came in um, pregnant. She was 33 weeks pregnant and she presented on May 4th at an outside hospital in Queens, New York with fever, dyspnea and cough. She was found to be hypoxic, 93% on 100% normal breather. Um, she had a real time PCR showing um, SARS-CoV-2 positive. Um, a chest X-ray showed uh, bilateral airspace opacities. She was intubated and an emergent C-section was performed at the outside hospital. Um, she was started on remdesivir, um, which is you know um, an antiviral that we are um, we are trialing here at Columbia and elsewhere. I'm not going to speak really more about that. She was started on high dose steroids um, at the outside hospital and broad spectrum antibiotics. Despite this, her oxygenation, ventilation, and compliance uh, worsened. Um, she developed a left-sided pneumothorax. A chest tube was placed. Her arterial blood gas showed worsening respiratory acidosis and low lung compliance despite um, max, maximal sedation and par paralysis, including addition of inhaled nitric oxide to improve her oxygenation. So um, her blood gas uh, prior to transfer was 7.17, um, PCO2 of 83, uh, PAO2 of 120, satting 100%, but that's on 100%. Um, uh, FiO2 by mechanical ventilation with a um, inhaled nitric oxide of 20 parts per million. Um, so very sick and the feeling was that because of the chest tube they were scared to prone her and so we deployed a team um, there and we cannulated her onto VV ECMO and transferred her to our facility. So this is the initial chest X-ray when she when she came over. You can see the uh, endotracheal tube is in place. Uh, you can see there's a uh, right IJ um, um, uh, ECMO um, catheter, and there's also a um, um, sort of faintly seen a um, femoral right femoral um, uh, uh, ECMO catheter placed uh, VV ECMO catheter placed as well, as well as a sub left subclavian line and a uh, NG tube. In her lung fields, you can sort of see there's um, diffuse opacities. There's also a um, you know, small to moderate, I'd say moderate left uh, pneumothorax with a chest tube in place, which was sort of incompletely draining that pneumothorax. And this was sort of how she came to us. 
She was continued in terms of therapeutics, she was continued on remdesivir. She was enrolled in a randomized controlled trial of convalescent plasma, um, which was donated by recovered um, uh, C19 patients in New York City and certified as high titer antibodies against the you know, S spike of the um, SARS CoV 2 uh, by our um, hemopathology group. We stopped the steroids, we continued um, the antibiotics. Her initial, initial labs were as follows. Um, uh, I mean, em embarrassed to say that apparently we did not check an IL-6 level the whole time she was in hospital, but, um, but that's the truth. I looked at it just recently. Um, and with that, her chest X-ray improved. Um, so um, her infiltrates, as you can see, this is seven days later, had been started to improve on um, chest X-ray. She was decannulated from ECMO. She was extubated. Um, and as of this morning, she's working with uh, physical therapy. Um, she's off oxygen altogether, and she's preparing to be home with her family and her uh, new baby, who is also doing well. So this was sort of um, really a happy story and one that a lot of people in our hospital are very, very happy to sort of see. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been um, totally typical of our um, ECMO uh, experience. We've had, um, I believe, 15 patients now uh, with, uh, treated with ECMO, and, and uh, the results have been you know, decidedly mixed, as we see in these patients who are severely ill. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing the publications by my colleagues as, we, um, uh, as they prepare those manuscripts. So last, I'm not sure where I am on time, but last I want to talk to you briefly about a randomized control trial that we're doing looking at COVID, uh, convalescent plasma for the treatment of critically ill COVID-19 patients. So this is a cartoon um, from Cell um, showing that um, um, antibodies against SARS-CoV-1 um, um, you know, uh, interrupt both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 from binding um, the ACE2 uh, receptor and entering into cells. So there's um, some evidence that, um, that antibodies against um, uh, this S spike um, both prevent um, um, cytotoxicity uh, as well as uh, uh, modulate um, and um, improve the dynamics of a uh, host immune response uh, to the virus. Um, and this is uh, really old data, right? This is um, the, uh, um, convalescent plasma has been used since well before the antibiotics era, well before the randomized control uh, era. Um, and so this is data from um, the um, Spanish influenza outbreak um, published in December 11th, 1919, um, looking at um, the treatment of uh, patients with influenza um, with uh, convalescent plasma. And this is um, data that has been sort of reviewed in a meta-analysis in the Annals of Internal Medicine. This is a really interesting meta-analysis because these um, studies that are sort of shown here in figure two are all um, non-randomized controlled trials. Why? Because they're all like well from before the time uh, that randomized controlled trials were developed as a uh, research modality. Um, so the control groups were either, um, you know, other patients from the same hospital or sort of historical controls, etc. But um, in H1N1, I'm sorry, H5, uh, in, sorry, in these Spanish influenza patients, um, this was uh, sort of uh, seemed to favor um, treatment uh, compared again to these controls. Um, and so similarly, there's, or at least there has been some scant data also showing the effectiveness of convalescent plasma therapy in severe. COVID-19 patients. As far as I'm aware, there are these 10 patients published in um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, in April, and then there were five patients published um, in an issue of JAMA, and those are, as far as I know, the, the published experience of patients being treated with COVID-19 um, with convalescent plasma.
<clears throat> and, and from these studies, though, there was a pretty substantial improvement um, in, in both clinical outcome as well as uh, biomarkers. And similarly, there was an improvement in um, copies of virus in the nasopharynx of these patients, you know, all, all of which suggesting that this would be highly effective. It's worth noting that these um, two studies were um, studies of patients who had um, high titers of neutralizing antibodies. So they tested um, these antibodies, not just um, uh, to confirm that they were antibodies against um, uh, the S spike uh, protein in the, um, of the virus, but also to confirm that they, there was high degree of neutralization using the sort of traditional sort of plaque uh, methods of sort of neutralizing uh, assays. Um, unfortunately, this is not altogether practical when you're um, trying to treat patients at a large hospital, as we've found out. So we, what we used for the trial that I'm going to describe to you is this figure that was published in um, um, the journal, uh, JCI, Journal of Clinical Investigations. Um, so we used uh, patients with a history of COVID-19, either uh, positive um, uh, um, by real-time PCR or positive clinically. Uh, we screened them um, uh, by looking at a ELISA, a home-brewed ELISA, uh, a trimer um, uh, ELISA against the S-spike protein. And we um, confirmed that they had a titer of at least four, greater than 400 for our study, greater than 320 in this figure. And those patients were um, then sort of uh, considered qualified donors. And those patients then donated plasma at our medical center, which was then sort of screened by our city blood bank and sort of returned uh, anonymized to our um, medical center. Oh, I'm sorry, this slide did not come out. Um, I'm going to move on from that. That was a slide describing our eligibility criteria for the, um, for the patients that we enrolled. So I talked to you about the donors, who they were, right? But the, the patients we enrolled were essentially patients with confirmed COVID-19 uh, with a real-time PCR for SARS-CoV-2 within 14 days were hypoxic on room air or requiring supplemental oxygen with a chest x-ray showing infiltrates um, who are not enrolled in another um, clinical trial um, who could be receiving antivirals including remdesivir um, who did not have IgA deficiency or a history of um, transfusion reaction and who could give informed consent uh, for to, to enroll in this study. The, the study, the way it works is there is an intervention arm um, where you're getting the, these um, convalescent plasma units. Um, we're infusing one unit, 200 ml unit, um, uh, into, in the intervention arm versus a control arm, which is a, essentially a, a con normal control plasma arm where patients are getting fresh frozen plasma. Um, and they're randomized in a two to one uh, basis. So to date, we've enrolled 49 patients in total, 31 in the intervention arm, 18 in the control arm. Um, you know, to date, we only have one adverse event um, to report. So similar to the uh, Hopkins data that came out um, in preprint uh, this week, uh, there's very few adverse events. Um, and it's unclear to me, um, as a sort of editorial note, uh, given the trajectory of the epidemic in New York City, the possibility for completion. So very fortunately, we're at, on the downswing. We're having far fewer patients enrolled, and, um, and that's been a, a lovely uh, problem to have. Uh, I'd sort of end there, and I'd end by thanking um, the uh, pulmonary critical care doctors at our institution, as well as the sort of pathology doctors um, who made this possible. Our funding has been through um, uh, Gilead for the remdesivir work and through Amazon for the convalescent plasma work. I'm going to stop there to leave hopefully a little bit of time for questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Max. That was an excellent talk and, uh, you know, very instructive, some lessons for us as we head into uh, a, a potential surge in, in Cape Town ourselves and, you know, particularly from your experiences in critical care, uh, you know, I think there's some, some important um, points that, that can guide us and, you know, from, from your talk and from, you know, colleagues.
in settings like yourself uh, uh, that, that we will look to in terms of the practices that we put in place. Um, so I'm going to move on to the uh, panel discussion and our panel, uh, we've got two members of our panel today, uh, and Tobacco Ntuzi, our Head of Medicine and a Cardiologist at the University of Cape Town, and uh, Richard Fancel smith uh, Pulmonologist and Critical Care Specialist. So Tobacco, I want to open it up to you if there's any points or, uh, that you want to make and, and questions that you want to uh, put to Max. Thanks, Graham, and thanks, Max, for taking time from what I'm sure is a very busy schedule uh, to come and speak to our department and to share your experience uh, from New York. Uh, and congratulations on your recent publication in The Lancet uh, a few days ago. Um, I have quite a few questions, but in the interest of time, maybe I can just ask three, Graham. Um, so the first question I have, uh, Max, is um, if you would mind just explaining to us uh, what your treatment protocols are and whether the use of uh, remdesivir um, and uh, corticosteroids are standard uh, in all of your patients. And if you can also comment uh, on the uh, ventilation strategies uh, you've used uh, in patients in ICU. Um, the, the second question, I'm interested um, in the 39% mortality rate uh, mm -hmm. and what you see to be the mechanism of uh, mortality. Is it an ARDS associated uh, with uh, hypoxia or are you seeing um, uh, sepsis uh, leading to multi-organ failure? Uh, and then the, the final question, uh, uh, which one should I ask? Let me ask about, uh, I was interested in the racial disparities uh, in terms of uh, patients' presentations uh, to hospital um, and uh, wondered um, if you could comment uh, on the uh, access uh, to healthcare and what your explanation for this are and whether you did affect um, uh, these uh, differences um, in uh, race or ethnicity in terms of your uh, outcomes. Thanks, Mary. So those are those are awesome questions and uh, and, and 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 large. Um, so um, the, to, to handle the the first uh, question first, um, you know our therapeutic strategies really evolved um, over time in every sense. Um, so. Um, you know, for example, um, looking at the JAMA Internal Medicine uh, article suggesting that, um, you know, uh, steroids were helpful in, um, you know, Chinese patients with COVID-19, our um, practice was initially to use uh, quite a lot of steroids. Um, and I think to, frankly, um, you know, I think that data might, frankly, have been somewhat biased. It was a retrospective study. And I think um, our feeling now is that that was to the, somewhat to the detriment of our patients. Um, and I think at this point, um, we are in the process of, um, of reviewing our data. Um, and I have a couple of different colleagues who are separately pursuing, you know, propensity score matched uh, analyses of um, steroid use. And, um, but what I expect to find is that it was associated with increased harm, frankly. Uh, particularly the higher doses. So we'll, you know, I'll, I'll wait to sort of update you on that. But I think in general, what one thing that I've concluded is that um, during an epidemic, you know, one feels like you, everyone has to try to do the best they can giving, given the circumstances for their patients. And I think that what I really strongly feel at this point is that has to include doing well-performed clinical research, even during an epidemic. You know, so, um, you know, with regret, I, I say that we should have been randomizing patients to steroids versus non-steroids, even, even while, you know, we were getting deluged with patients and that did not happen. Um, so a lot of the uh, practices that we um, pursued at the beginning of the epidemic, for example, using anti-IL-6 uh, inhibitors, we use uh, much less now. And I think in, in very much in selected patients who are, um, you know, with carefully excluded co-infections and um, are sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, we were, there was a thought early in the epidemic that, um, you know, treating patients who are mildly ill with uh, anti-IL-6 might be helpful. And I think that now we think that that was probably not the case. Uh, the data still is a bit nascent, but that's sort of 
um, that's changing. The other thing that sort of you mentioned that's changing is we, we were very much in the early intubate um, uh, uh, mode uh, during that early part of the epidemic to pre prevent um, nosocomial uh, spread of, of the disease. Um, you know, and, and because we did not have sure. negative pressure rooms uh, to, uh, to isolate these patients in, um, and we were concerned with aerosolization. And I think that's become much less of a concern. Uh, we also innovated the use, uh, as many other uh, centers have, in sort of uh, non-intubated proning, and I think we use that a lot more now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I know that's not much of a, uh, a, uh, an answer, but I think that um, the large answer is that um, we focus more on um, traditional modes of critical care uh, for these patients. We've moved away uh, somewhat um, from therapeutics um, that are more experimental. Um, remdesivir would be an exception to that. We use uh, that uh, now widely um, in our institution. Um, you know, um, we think that the benefits are modest, but they're probably there, um, and that the harms are also um, uh, less severe. Um, so I'm going to stop there and move to your second question, which I believe was about, um, was it about cause of death in these patients? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, great question. Um, so many of our patients who die later are dying of, you know, respiratory associated uh, ailments. So these are patients who have very severe um, low lung compliance. Um, so I know, uh, I'm sure you've followed with interest as I have, uh, Professor Gatnoni and his groups sort of hypothesized L cards and H cards sort of phenotypes of ARDS in COVID. We are not seeing that. Um, we haven't seen that. And we've, um, as I said, intubated our patients quite early. And so if there was an L phenotype uh, to see, at least in our setting, we've not particularly seen that. You know, maybe in a small percentage, sure, it's possible. But in median, our, um, our lung compliance was very low. And so many of our patients who did die have died of sort of um, respiratory com uh, complications of sort of being uh, ventilated, you know, um, to sort of meet the, that, that, um, those very stiff lungs. A lot of pneumothorax. Uh, for example. We've also seen a, a lot, a ton of thrombosis. So I know we all appreciate that acute infection is the cause of acute thrombosis. And yet, um, I think we underappreciated the, the significance of that, particularly early on. Uh, the other thing that I would have say, said that I would have underappreciated uh, three months ago was the degree of renal failure and requirement for dialysis that we've seen has been enormous. Um, and so, um, uh, so I would say that um, in addition to the, the comments I made about therapeutics, the other thing that we're routinely doing is doing, um, you know, um, particularly among patients who are critically ill, particularly among patients who have elevated uh, biomarkers, um, it's pretty routine to use a, a half-dose therapeutic uh, anticoagulation. Obviously, that's a strategy not without risks, but that's sort of, um, and, and that's sort of yet to be confirmed. We have an ongoing um, clinical trial on that, which will probably also not reach uh, its numbers to be powered to to show a difference. Right, and then, and then there was one last question about the racial disparities. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, as you're aware, um, in a way, the um, the uh, ICU is sort of a a, a, a pinnacle of of care and sort of absorbs a lot of the disparities that sort of uh, come along. Um, through it. So I think that there are disparities in terms of, um, you know, uh, comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, etc., which reflect, you know, um, you know, disparities that are sort of exist long before the ICU. There are also disparities in access to hospitalization, um, which has to do with, um, you know, um, you know, racial disparities in society and also patterns of, of, uh, of care seeking practices. Um, so I think that um, largely that those explain, I think, um, what we see in terms of racial disparities, as well as the underlying sort of catchment area of our hospital. But I would, so I would say the fact that these comorbidities are generated by racial disparities, which sort of, um, you know, pre-exist the ICU, that, um, that there's an access to care issue that we see in time to presentation, um, but then also just reflecting the catchment area. Um, the other thing that I'm sort of interested in also is the the gender disparity. So this is a male predominant um, disease, certainly in our ICU. And there's some suggestion. Um, I just looked at a very interesting preprint 
uh, by David uh, Goldstein uh, et al. Um, showing um, the sort of androgen reg reg uh, regulation of the um, TMPRSS1, I believe, um, co-receptor for the ACE2 that sort of allows um, uh, entry of the virus into the cell. Um, so there might be a, a, a biological, um, you know, uh, underpinning of the gender disparity um, that we're seeing as well. Um, but that's just, um, again, it's sometimes not clear that these sort of um, uh, transcriptional screens rep uh, are, are what's sort of replicating or what's sort of generating the epidemiologic sort of uh, inequalities that we see. Right. Thanks, Ntavek and Max. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move on to uh, Richard Fancel Smith. Richard, uh, do you want to come in? Any questions? Yeah, well, let me just make one comment and then one question. I know we, we are late on time. Um, so we are very much at the beginning. We have 33 patients that have been admitted to ICU. And I think one important thing is that in South Africa, or certainly in Cape Town, Kuroskia will only admit to ICU for ventilation, but Tigerberg, for example, will be admitting high flow to ICU. So one has to be careful when one looks at the data as to ICU mortality. But up until Monday, we'd had a 100% ventilator mortality and we've sus subsequently discharged two. So we are very much learning our way and I'm very grateful for the international literature to tell us what's coming and give us some idea of where to go. The one big issue we have at the moment, which maybe you can help us out with, is that our experience of dialysis has been a complete and utter disaster. Um, no one seems to have survived, so much so that we are even questioning whether we should be instituting dialysis, and if we are, for how long. Can you give us some idea of how long you went for on dialysis, or what your um, triggers were to palliate or to keep going? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and I, I'm involved with colleagues in our renal group that are sort of have a, a manuscript under, um, that's been submitted uh, looking specifically at these dialysis patients. Um, um, yeah, no, so the, um, you know, there's been a really interesting and very powerful discussion about ethics, you know, um, the United States is very much um, puts the primacy uh, of the discussion in the patient's hands and in the family's hands. Um, so um, it's, you know, sort of um, patients uh, up until now have been able to ask for and insist on um, dialysis for their loved one, even if um, the team thought um, feels that it's medically futile. Um, and that sort of changed during this epidemic, but simply because we do not have the machines. So we literally uh, ran out of machines frequently and our sort of renal doctors would sort of literally schedule CVVH and be discontinuing CVVH on patients, uh, continuous uh, venal venal uh, hemodialysis on patients and transferring these machines to other patients um, in a scheduled fashion, um, which is um, obviously not our usual practice. So we've had to um, ration care in that setting. So, you know, people who are at the uh, extremities of sort of uh, disease severity, you know, with very high Apache 2 or SOFA scores or other markers of severity or extremes of age have been simply not uh, offered dialysis in the setting that it felt that it wouldn't benefit them. Um, many of our patients who have been started on, um, on, on CVVH in hospital have uh, remained on intermittent hemodialysis as they've come out of the ICU. Um, that's very typical. Um, renal recovery we have seen. I don't have the figures in, in front of me, but certainly um, there's been a, a, a substantial minority who have, who have had renal recovery in this um, setting. We've found, um, you know, microalbumin um, you know, as a um, as an important uh, marker for incipient renal failure in our patients, um, but um, that is that's a very uh, difficult um, problem. Um, I do sort of appreciate the um, the difficulty of of um, you know of one hundred percent mortality on the vent is 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 very severe. Um, I would say that uh, it's sort of a catch-22. Um, we try to maintain patients on non-invasive mechanical, uh, non-invasive ventilation as long as we can, and then, unfortunately, uh, when we by the time we intubate them, they can be their their lungs can be quite stiff and quite uh, fibrotic. Um, so that can be sort of you know it's hard to know when when the right time is to intubate them. Um, but I, I can appreciate if you're, you have 100% mortality that um, that that's sort of hard to. Uh, 
justify. Yeah, so we've had our two first ventilator survivals as said this week, and I think we are in that phase trying to balance the high flow versus intubation decision. We've had a couple that I think we probably have waited too late um, and may have crashed with a pulmonary embolus or something. But on the other hand, the experience, again, from groups like yourselves, the early intubation doesn't seem to be a, uh, a good idea either. And so we're having to feel our way through when is the right time to, to intubate and try and individualize that, which um, is a, a challenge for all, I think. Yeah, no, I'd love to, um, I'd love to sort of continue this discussion. We have like a, a really, a really good group. And I think there'd be people who'd be really interested in having this conversation in, in some more detail. Um, but, um, but the short story is you're right. Uh, early intubation is no panacea. We've moved towards um, non-invasive ventilation. We've moved towards a lot towards awake proning and we've sort of protocolized that um, working with our physical ther therapy colleagues. That's been very extraordinarily helpful. Um, and um, uh, but that I think has been a way to sort of, um, you know, to obviate um, intubations for us or to mitigate intubations, and that's been helpful. Uh, but but you're right. Um, if you wait too long, you can sort of crash people onto intubation, and and it's not um, to their you know to their imminent demise. Uh, Great. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I just wanted to go back to Mark and ask if there's one or two questions from the chat room that that you want to bring up. Mark's just unmuting himself. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we'll just, uh, some of the questions have been covered already, but maybe just one or two. In the case study described, uh, was fetal distress the indication for emergency cesarean section was the one question. And then we had a question around what your view on ECMO is from David Thompson from ICU. Uh, wanting to know if you feel this can alter the course versus uh, um, the damage done by invasive ventilation. And then lastly, maybe just to end off with a question from Sean Busserman around antibiotic usage in these patients given the low background prevalence of bacterial co-infection. What is your policy be? Yeah. Now those are, th so those are um, great questions. Um, so um, I was not at the outside hospital, so I'm not sure the um, the absolute indication for um, cesarean section, but I think it was that she was going into severe respiratory failure. I do know that um, the child was um, actually, the, the, the infant was uh, initially intubated and was in the, um, the neonatal intensive care unit at the outside hospital, was not transferred, um, and, but is now out of uh, the NICU and is actually at home. Um, so, and then to transition from there, um, to ECMO, we've had um, at least um, three or four ECMO survivors out of 15, but again, these are very selected patients. Um, so I'm not, I'm not um, sure about, um, there, there's the sort of countervailing benefit of um, sparing the lungs, this, um, these high pressures, these very stiff lungs, the high pressures and sort of preventing pneumothoraces um, or you know, um, relieving these pressures. But there's also the countervailing risk of these patients are not just prothrombotic, but they have dysregulated uh, coagulation. So there's a very high bleeding risk, and I'm thinking very specifically of a, young fifth, a, a, a young, younger 50-year-old, a healthy 50-year-old who had a, a severe um, um, so I think there's a risk both of thrombosis as well as abnormal bleed. Um, so, um, you know, again, um, I think there's benefit in selected patients, but it's been very difficult, particularly with staffing um, these, these patients. Uh, we've had, um, as you know, an ECMO patient takes a lot of staffing and we've had, we've been spread very, very thin. So it's really only now towards the end of the epidemic that we've been able to have like the accustomed number of 10 to 15 patients on ECMO at any given time. And then the last question was about antibiotics. Uh, sure, yeah. So, I mean, honestly, um, it's a really good question. And we do um, initially treat these patients with antibiotics, um, you know, analogous to severe flu, thinking that, um, you know, bacterial co-infection is common. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that we've 
Um, we've driven a lot of uh, severe drug resistance in these patients. And in combination with using high dose steroids, which frankly has been uh, somewhat of a disaster, um, you know, has, has really um, driven home the, the downside of that empiric strategy. Um, I would probably use antibiotics uh, up front. I would probably uh, be guided by clinical guidelines and procalcitonin levels to sort of uh, taper antibiotics as, as possible. But it's very hard when you have a patient with uh, pulmonary infiltrates with fever um, that you're sort of scared to bronch because you don't want to expose your staff or yourself to, um, to the virus um, to, sort of, uh, to sort of say that we're not going to treat that patient with antibiotics. Um, when this could very well be a bacterial superinfection. Uh, on autopsy series, which are very interesting and are just starting to come out now, including out of Germany, including out of New York City, um, there, is, uh, there does seem to be uh, primary viral lung infection. So um, it's very interesting. Um, so it may be that these infiltrates that we're seeing are not bacterial superinfection, are not sort of just immunologic phenomena. But, um, but are actually represent, um, you know, viral uh, infection and inflammation. Max, can, can I ask you one last brief question more it's sort of outside of the hospital? Mm -hmm. uh, you showed us in the initial slides that the effect of lockdown in New York was to dramatically reduce the cases and obviously people are now under substantial lockdown in New York City. What is the uh, general feeling of the population about easing the lockdown, uh, given the, the, the uh, potential for resurgence of that, that really furious epidemic that you encountered? Yeah, no, I think that, um, that people are very, uh, very worried. Um, you know, I, um, my neighbors or my close friends, we haven't seen each other except uh, from the stoop in nine weeks. Um, uh, my children are uh, are not seeing their friends um, uh, at all, so I think that there's a lot of uh, fear, and yet at the same time, it's been uh, it's been you know some time, and I think there's a real eagerness um, to to um, you know to move uh, back towards a, a social engagement with your neighbors. Um, I would say there's also a huge economic issue when you're talking to, you know, um, people who have been un unemployed, working class people who have been unemployed for this, this um, whole period. Uh, there's a huge pressure. Lots of people are not paying their rent. So I think there's a countervailing social pressure uh, in, uh, against the uh, public health medical uh, perspective, which might be to sort of, you know, do contact tracing, to do uh, thorough, um, you know, PCR testing to, you know, establish a real good sort of zero prevalence of exposure um, as ways to really understand, um, you know, risk. So I think that is countervailed against both social and economic needs. So I, that's hmm. not my expertise, but that's my impression. Great, thanks, Max. So to just say th thank you to, to Marianne, who gave the first talk to Max uh, for this fantastic overview, to Richard and Tobacco for the uh, really useful panel discussion. I think the panel discussion, I think your reflections on, on uh, the, the therapies that haven't worked and the strategies that haven't worked is, has been incredibly useful because one doesn't always get that by reading the literature about things that people are abandoning. So. To, to hear what's worked and what hasn't worked and how your practice has evolved is, is really useful to us. So thanks, thanks again to everyone. I think it's been a fantastic webinar and um, we'll have our next webinar uh, next week, this time, Wednesday next week, uh, and we'll be advertising it over the weekend. So thanks, Max. Thank All you. Best. Okay, bye. bye.